These are some of the tiny little cocoons that the worms lay. These are rather freshly laid, very tiny. Just to give some perspective on how small they are. Hey folks, welcome back to the wonderful world of Wilderstead worms. Today I'm just going to go over questions that folks have and answer them about growing your worms, what to feed them, all kinds of stuff. And for a little bit of added fun, we'll use this microscope to check out some of the worm cocoons and just some close-ups on the worms because they are really, really cool. Let's start off with collecting your worms. So a lot of folks have said, you know, you can just go into your backyard, pick the worms, why don't you just do that? And I've explained in the initial video that where we are, we have very little topsoil. These worms, although they're called Canadian night crawlers, they're not native to North America. And they're mainly found in areas where you have a lot of topsoil, grass, things like that. We're sitting on bedrock. So we can no longer collect them. I did that all the time as a kid living in Southern Ontario. But at this point, it's just not feasible to get the big, juicy dewworms that you want when you're fishing for things like bass or pike or steelhead. So, where can you get these? Your regular bait shop. These particular worms that I stocked our bins with initially a year or two ago, they came from Canadian Tire. So check your local bait shops. A lot of questions about water and how moist to keep your worm bins. This is gonna really vary based on where you are. If you're in a very dry climate, you're gonna have to add a little bit more water. A moist, humid climate, you're not going to have to. Uh, just as an example, I really don't add any water into this stuff at all. You, you just, you don't want it to be dry. So you want it to form a little ball like that. And that's moist enough. That's enough moisture in there. You don't want it to be dry. That's the main thing. They need it to be moist. What kind of water I use initially when starting the worm bins? For us, we're on well water. So our water is not treated in any way. It just comes straight out of the ground. So I would suggest probably using rainwater or something like that as opposed to city tap water that potentially has chlorine in it fluoride, various other things that could be in that water. So if you can get a hold of rainwater or spring water or something like that, that's probably your best bet. I can't give a proper answer, but I'm assuming that chlorine and other chemicals like that are probably not too beneficial for your worms. Temperature. And what do you do with your worms in the wintertime? You want to keep your worm bins uh, in around five degrees Celsius. Uh, you can go a little higher. I would not be pushing it above 10 degrees Celsius. You're really gonna stress your worms out doing that. You need to be able to keep your worms in a cool, cool environment. In the winter time, this is another question that a few folks had. What do you do in the winter time? So for us, initially we were keeping them underneath the house in our crawl space, which stays at a maximum of 10 degrees Celsius. It's, it's usually around five degrees down there. Since we've started keeping the greenhouse going, I've moved the bins out here and I keep them stored in a cupboard in here. And the cupboard also sits at around five degrees Celsius for the most part. Sometimes it gets a little cooler than that, but that's okay. So unheated garage might be a good idea. Anywhere where you're gonna be hovering down around that freezing mark, maybe a little bit above, in the summertime here, we often just keep the bins in our insulated storage container that we have here. That way we have easy access to worms throughout the summer to go fishing. And again, the big thing is keeping them at optimal temperatures. Don't let that get above 10 degrees Celsius if you can help it. Soil maintenance, another big one that folks are asking about. So as far as things go, once you have your worm bins established, and if you follow the method, the lasagna method that I show in the first video, you really don't need to add anything into it aside from some food for the worms, which could be in any form really, uh, used coffee grinds, vegetable scraps, things like that, even just regular leaf litter, like what we use in the original recipe to start the bins. Just add some of that stuff in as you see the organic matter start to become depleted. Now, if you look at these two bins, this bin here has had all of the worms removed from it. 
Okay, this has now basically been completely broken down by the worms. There's no newspaper left. There's a few things like, I guess, some of the compost had some eggshells in it. You can see there. So those are still lingering around. But outside of that, most of this has been broken down. And now this is just, this is an excellent uh, compost or fertilizer for your garden. And you can even just plant directly into this. It's not like regular manure, like chicken manure that is really hot and has to be composted to break down. This bin here, this is the bin that we currently do still have worms in. And you can see it's still got some chunky stuff in here. Uh, sticks, little bits and pieces of leaves. There's probably still some of the... Uh, Newspaper bits, there's one right there. There's a little newspaper bit that's left over. And the worms are still working on breaking down what's in this bin. So as long as you're feeding the worms, you don't really have to necessarily move them around. The only reason this bin is empty is because last fall, we wanted to condense things down. And we also wanted to package some of the worms into containers so that we could use them over the winter for ice fishing. There were a few questions about how to sort through without necessarily, can you disturb the soil without harming the worms if you want to pick through and see what's going on in your bin? What I usually do is just take a stick and use the stick to gently dig around in there. And eventually you'll probably find a worm. Like that little guy. The stick is a good idea because you can just loosely move things around like this because when you have the little baby worms in here, the little baby worms are quite delicate and you don't, you know, you don't want to be hurting them when you're mucking around. If you're like doing this kind of thing in the soil, like I'll do it in here. If you're doing that kind of thing, there's a good chance that you're going to squish some of those little worms up. You want to avoid doing that, obviously. You want those little worms to grow up into these... Nice big fat guys. Do we have any mold problems? Not really. The odd time when you open up one of your bins, you might notice some mold. It's pretty easy just to take whatever you find and just stick it down underneath the ground. The worms will eat everything. So no, there's, as you can see, we don't really have any mold problems aside from the odd little bit that might appear. Do we harvest their compost? Yes, we do. There's some of it right there. And this can just be top dressed on your plants. You can plant directly in it. Anything you might want to do with it, just treat it like perfectly composted compost. Now on to the soil and worm bin components. Big question, especially coming out of the UK for some reason, does it have to be black earth? And what is black earth? Black earth is just extremely rich topsoil or potting soil and it typically is this color very nice nice black black color rich with organic matter really any untreated soil that you can get a hold of is going to be just fine to use I would definitely not suggest using something like a miracle grow that potentially has some chemical fertilizers in it or things like that that may not be too beneficial for your worms now a lot of folks were concerned about the newspaper, and in particular, about the colored ink. Something that folks should know is that the vast majority of newsprint is printed using vegetable oil-based ink. That's because it's cheap. It's very cheap for the printing companies to use. And I'd be hard-pressed to find any newsprint ink that is not vegetable-based. Colored, black, gray, whatever, whatever color. I've been doing this for years. The newsprint, the ink, never been a problem whatsoever. What do we feed them? Well, we've gone over this in both of the previous videos and in this video already once before, but vegetable scraps, used coffee grounds, leaf litter from the forest, grass clippings, pretty much anything you could put in there, the worms will eat. I would probably avoid things like meat though, Worms probably aren't going to eat the meat and it will just rot in there. Unused coffee grounds, uh, you could probably feed them those, but one thing to pay attention to is that coffee is quite acidic. 
So unused coffee is going to be far more acidic than used or spent coffee grounds because all of that acidity is pulled out when you make your coffee. So personally, I stick to the used coffee grounds, but hey, you could experiment with your bin if you want. If they're called Canadian night crawlers, how are they not native to Canada? Well, they're called Canadian night crawlers because of marketing. And I mean, I would imagine US marketing, United States, because there's some great fishing in Canada and we do know our bait quite well. But these worms are not native to North America. They are an invasive species and they basically have overtaken large areas, particularly agricultural areas where the soil is worked and it's easy for the worms to get around. So these are not a native species to North America at all. How many worms do you need to start with in your worm bin? Uh, it really depends on the size of your bin, how many you want to reproduce, how much bait you go through, or if you're feeding these to your frogs or things like that, how many worms that you need for your frogs. I started the original bin with roughly two dozen dewworms, and it's just continued to grow from there. So in a bin this size, Maybe start with two dozen, maybe start with four dozen if you really want to push it. These larger earthworms do not grow or reproduce as quickly as red wiggler vermicomposting worms. They take anywhere from 70 to well over 300 days to reach maturity. So it's a long-term project. This is not something that you start and expect to see results and bait in your hand in a month. How many worms can a single bin hold? Well. That's dependent on the size of your bin. These bins here, I would estimate, probably could hold 100 worms, maybe 200 worms. I really don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's a really tough call. Do you have to separate the adults from the baby worms? No, not necessarily. I do, specifically because when I'm separating them, I'm actually pulling the adult worms out to be used as bait and leaving the baby worms behind to continue to grow. When you decide to go fishing, do you take the large adult worms or the small juvenile worms? Well, that kind of depends what you're fishing for. If I'm going out for bass or something like that, or steelhead, big rainbow trout, salmon, I'll be using the big worms. If I'm going for, you know, a little brook trout or something like that, just for a little day out fishing, I'll probably try using some of the small little worms because, I mean, the brook trout are tiny. So again, that's totally dependent on what you're fishing for. You can also take the larger worms and break them up into little chunks. So this one was a little bit weird, but when I put the lid on the container, do they not need oxygen to breathe? Yes, they do. That's why we put holes in the top and the bottom of the bins. When you drill holes in the bottoms of the bins, do the worms not escape out of those holes? And the answer is no. If you have worms escaping out of your bins, something is wrong in your bin. It could be too hot, it could be too wet, it could be too dry, there could be rotting food in there. Who knows what it is, but if the worms are trying to escape your bin, something is wrong in the bin. What size holes? Well, I used a quarter inch drill bit to drill the holes in these bins. I find that to be perfectly sufficient for airflow, drainage if needed. These bins never leak. If, if your bins are leaking, it's clearly too wet. So hopefully that clears some of those questions up. Uh, now I want to fiddle around with this microscope and check out some of these cocoons and some close up shots of some worms. These are some of the tiny little cocoons that the worms lay. These are rather freshly laid, very tiny. Just to give some perspective on how small they are, I'm pointing with this little piece of root that is about the diameter of a hair, just tiny. And you can see down in here just how small that those little cocoons are. Each cocoon will have anywhere from one to about five baby worms in it. And when they do hatch, the worms come out as just tiny little white thread-like beings. Pretty neat. They don't really look like a worm until they start to grow a little bit. These two are a little bit larger, and these have already hatched. You can see that 
tiny, tiny, tiny little hole in there. That's where the worms would have come out of. Both of these are hatched. I would say they're probably close to five times the size of the freshly hatched cocoons. As the worms grow inside of them, the cocoon expands until the worms are ready to hatch. I'm just trying to clean the dirt off of this one little cocoon here so that we can get a little bit of an idea of the size difference. So that little yellow thing there, that is a freshly laid cocoon. And this is one of the larger hatched out cocoons. Big size difference there. I'm just letting this guy do his thing for the time being here. Just see what, what it looks like on the microscope. This is what you see on your phone with this little microscope thing. Very cool little instrument. Highly recommend. You can see they've got these little grippy things that help them move through the dirt on their sides there. Very cool little creatures. They just have all these segments that work together to move the worm around. I just, I find it so neat because this is also like how they dig and they burrow and they make holes. It's just like one gigantic muscle. Let's see if we can get a headshot. That is the worm's mouth. That's pretty cool looking. So that's looking straight down on the worm's head and it looks like it might actually start to burrow for us. That would be pretty neat. Thing zooms in so close, it's quite hard to follow them around. Where is he? There he is. Trying to go under that little stick there. It looks like these two might be setting up to mate. It's hard to say. When they're tight together like that, though, that's a pretty good indication that that's what's going to happen. If you've ever wondered what a Canadian night crawler looks like up close and personal, now you know. So that's what this little microscope does. Pretty neat. It's got some LED lights inside of there. It has magnifying, little button here. Little LED light dimmer switch right here. And then this is your power button and also just to record video or to take pictures. Very neat little thing, hooks up through Wi-Fi to your phone. I like it, it's neat and it's cheap. Link in the description for this. Mm -hmm.